This is Don Quixote. It's a novel from the 17th century written by Spain's most famous writer, Cervantes. It's about a man who loses his mind and thinks he's a knight, even though knights haven't existed for hundreds of years. He kind of rambles about the countryside, causing chaos with his sidekick, Sancho. He sees giants, wizards, and castles that aren't there. But what if he wasn't in Spain in the 17th century? What if he found himself in our world? What if instead of the rolling hills of La Mancha, he found himself in a place like this, in Chester, UK, maybe in one of our nightclubs on a night out, surrounded by revelers fueled by booze and kebabs? The best of times. Those are the questions that I asked, and I want to tell you how they helped me when I felt most vulnerable. But I'm just going to pop Cervantes and his book up on the E over here. Lovely. It's nice to bring him with me. So, I'd like to take you back to 2020. It's a time that none of us want to go back to very quickly, but I promise it will be worth it in the end. So I was living here in Chester, trying to soldier on with my PhD. And my PhD was research looking at theatre and theatre adaptations. Most centrally, looking at when we turn books into plays. A thing that I'd done with my theatre company for quite a while. And I was writing an adaptation of Don Quixote trying to modernise it, place it in a different setting and see what it had to say. Then, the COVID lockdown in the UK began in March of 2020. And as someone deemed extremely clinically vulnerable, I kept myself to myself. Food was delivered by the local grocers and placed on the step. They rang and stepped away and I would answer the door. Um, I took to writing my thesis in the backyard at a rickety pub table that I think we'd bought for, you know, nothing online. The one time I'd allow myself to leave the house or leave the yard was the dog walk that I'd go on, making sure to keep two metres away from everyone, even if I knew them, and shouting conversations across the road sometimes. We tried to make things more bearable. So, I can remember RuPaul's Drag Race watch parties on Zoom with the girls, all trying to press play at the same time so it synced up, and it often didn't. Um, we took to barbecuing. Me and my housemate became obsessed with barbecuing. We called our barbecue Keith, after Keith Flint from The Prodigy, the original fire starter. And we did those online quizzes. And they got weird really quickly. When you have friends like mine, the quizzes they do are strange. And I think this got to its peak when one of the rounds was a live feed of a goat on a farm, and you had to watch the goat, ask it a question, it could hear you apparently, and then you would see what its answer was based on did it move its head, did it turn away, did it eat some grass. We did all these strange things to make it bearable. But even with all that effort, a problem started to grow. More and more, I felt isolated. Like the world carried on moving and I was left behind. So then we started making steps to meet up. Tentatively, society began to open a little bit. Um, and things that really stuck out to me is we had Black Lives Matter protests in Chester that I was really keen to be there and take part in, but I couldn't. It wasn't safe. So I ended up having to watch the official Instagram feed of those protests in my home, feeling very disconnected. And I was left with a feeling, what use am I? What use am I? What use is my research that I spend all my time doing? What does the world care about what I write about the plays that I've written based on the books that I like? At a time when movements like BLM were asking us to wake up, I was stuck in a very sleepy state, writing away. But then something happened. I can remember being there and watching the news when in Bristol, BLM mar uh, protesters tore down the statue of Edward Colston and dumped it in the Bristol dock. 
and a light bulb went on for me. I thought, wait, that looks familiar. I think I can understand what's going on here through a different lens. Adaptation. So if we put it in the, in the, the parlance of my subject area, the statue was a text. The protesters looked at the text, considered it, looked at what it meant, and then put it in a different context, the dock. Now, granted, not everyone will agree with that. However, we can all agree it certainly said something. So on reflection, a thought started to germinate. We were being asked to reconsider, reassess and rethink about everything around us, the societal imbalances that we lived with and sort of gone unnoticed. And again, this was familiar, but I needed to find a way to make it connect. So I went looking and here's what I found. There are lots of scholars who write about stories. Stories are important to us, particularly to our understanding of the world and ourselves. In understanding ourselves, we construct our identity based on stories. If you were to ask me how I ended up here on this stage, I will tell you a story. Well, I was doing this work and I got ill and when I was in hospital, I thought, thought I want to change in my life. And then I ended up going to Chester and doing a, an MRES and a PhD and blah, blah, blah. And, it's a story, it's a narrative, and we often put ourselves in the hero role. Or we might understand others via narrative as well. There's a suggestion that we understand the world around us and the behaviour of others through precedents, through frameworks we've already learnt from stories. For example, I might understand love through when I've seen it on and in films for when I've read about it in books or seen it play out on the stage. However, there is a disclaimer, if I only went on what I knew about love through Hollywood movies, I'd be a little bit, a little bit kind of unbalanced. If I only went on love from Romeo and Juliet, I might think that it always ends with death. So stories help us understand the world and those around us. That's interesting. Then I came across an idea called the moral imagination. Now, this is an idea from a sort of moral philosophy that we understand the world and we make decisions about it based not on rules, based not on a list of rules, but on imagination. So the older conception was something happened and we would put it against our list of rules of, that we live by for wherever we've got them from. And if they disagree with those rules, we take this option or that one. The moral imagination suggests that these moments are imaginative, that in those moments we imagine the consequences. It's a creative imaginative act. In that moment we're thinking, well, if I did this, this would happen and this might happen. We're making it up, it is imagination. And specifically, I found the, writer of, I found the writings of Mark Johnson from 1993, a philosopher from America, who said, the moral imagination is informed by certain factors. These might be upbringing, these might be the behaviour of those around us, like our friends, or really interesting for me, another light bulb moment, media. So in part how we see the world, how we make choices about it and how we understand it is in part informed by media, by narrative, by stories and art. There we are. So, rewinding back to my craft, adaptation, the thing that I'd been doing with my theatre company that I was researching, when we go back to that, we find an interesting connection to stories and storytelling. It is a genre where we take a story that's already out there, we look at it again, we ask it questions, and then we reshape it. So if stories shape how we see the world and how we interact with it, how might adaptation fit into that? I suggest that adaptation offers us a chance to take those stories that we've already told and re-look at them, 
to reassess, to ask those questions. Just as we were being asked to reassess and ask questions of the world around us, adaptation gives us a chance to ask those questions of the stories we've already told and return to them again and reflect. We ask what they have to say and they might be new things we find. We might see similar things in a fresh context. If you think of the millions of different versions of Hamlet that have been over the years, each time they find something new or something different, or at least hopefully they do. So, I was doing this with Don Quixote. I was adapting it. I was working through a process. It was a book that was written 400 years ago, but I was finding it had a lot to say about here and now. It's a book about a man who loses grip on reality and rambles around, causing comic mayhem, as I mentioned at the start. But I found when we placed that in a modern context, it felt very, very different. If we see a person who has lost grip, we, we label them as vulnerable and we try to help them. That leapt off the page and leapt into my imagination. Vulnerability, vulnerable. I'd been shut in for months. I was obsessed with the news. I got repetitive strain injury in my thumb from refreshing the BBC news page. I went down a rabbit hole of obsession. I felt pretty vulnerable. The news was telling me that people like me, extremely clinically vulnerable, were at risk. There was danger everywhere. But in that danger, in that vulnerability, people made steps to help. The doctor would call and we'd have these odd little chats and I negotiated my dog walk policy with him that I'd be allowed out for one dog walk in the evening. The grocer, as I said, would pop stuff on the, on the step and we'd do all things COVID safe and they'd knock and step away and we'd have a tentative nod or a wave when they dropped it off or the best one, a kind of optimistic thumbs up. A kind of a couple of times that came out and I felt the world's going to be okay. We've got a thumbs up. And at that time, my housemate, we, we sat down and had a big conversation. Um, he asked me what was okay to do, what was safe to do, because he wasn't in the same boat as me. And we came to a lot of decisions. It was really kind of, it meant a lot to me that he asked. He could not have done. A lot of people who I know in similar positions weren't asked. But, you know, we came to a lot of agreements. And he joined the local aid group. So then you may have seen this in your community during COVID. Local aid groups kind of popped up. And what they would do is they would identify vulnerable people in the community and they'd help them out. Maybe drop off the paper or drop off the shopping. Sometimes have a two metre away chat and check in. There are vulnerable people all around us. And at that moment, people stepped in to care. That's what my Don Quixote became about because that's what I saw in the text and what I was seeing in my life. And I could make this, this play um, a, a, an act of moral imagination about vulnerability and care, about how we help each other. Don Quixote in the book needs his mate Sancho. He needs saving, saving in my, in my adaptation from uh, a rotary washing line that he nearly gets choked by, a bingo caller who is terrifying, or the police. There's all these situations where Sancho steps in and helps. And with the police, he is the one to step in to say, look, I know he's, I know he's a, bit, a bit chaotic, but I'll look after him, get him home, it'll be okay. In Cervantes' book, I saw two people helping each other out and getting through it together. I looked up from the laptop at the world around me in 2020 and I saw people doing the same, people helping each other and trying to get through it together. So I made Don Quixote speak to 2020. That book from the 1600s had so much to say about COVID. We re-looked we reconsidered and we put that book in conversation with the modern day. I used adaptation to engage in moral imagination. Audiences can go on that journey as well, see the play and maybe feel something about the nature of care and vulnerability. If we consume stories about care, 
we might be more inclined to care for each other. Support isn't easy. Sometimes it can be bleak. But through an adaptation of a 400-year-old book, I found the words to say to the world at the scariest time that many of us have lived through. I looked to the world and found the power of care. And through Don Quixote, I found the words to talk about that at that time. So, I'll leave you with something that my Sancho says to Don Quixote. For everyone who's felt vulnerable, I'd rather be in your company and things go sideways than be alone and bored. And whatever is to come, I'm here for you. Thank you.